Welcome to Asset Identification Process Descriptions, and thank you for your interest. We hope you'll take time after this short presentation to explore the other Triad Unlimited presentations on YouTube, follow us on LinkedIn, and visit our website to see all our service and training offerings. So let's start with asset identification. Here you can see the function definition. Asset identification is about defining what is an asset, organizing the assets in a way that their data can be used by everybody who wants to know about them or find out information about the assets, documenting assets so that the records are complete and that we develop a language that ensures that we all understand what we're talking about when we discuss assets, and prioritizing the assets so that we know which ones are the most important so we can focus the greater resources on them when we take care of them. Asset identification is really important because it really establishes the size of the program by defining what's going to be included in it. Now we'll talk about benefits. Besides the obvious benefit of knowing how many things we need to take care of, we also develop a justification for that number in the form of logical rules that are applied uniformly to all of our assets as we identify them. The rules are generally based on asset types, as indicated by the tags on P&IDs or engineering drawings. For instance, we might decide as an organization to exclude all small solenoid valves or small motors or manual valves from being assets, where these items would then be managed as components or spare parts of an asset. All decisions about what is an asset are based on some rules that we establish. Organizing assets helps all end users of asset information find what they need quickly and accurately, making the asset management program more efficient and effective. Using consistent, complete information to build asset records ensures everyone who uses the information shares a common language when talking about the assets. And prioritizing the assets allows us to focus our resources on what is important to the business. The idea is to use our resources effectively by directing them at the most important assets in terms of failure consequence. The processes that we use in asset identification sort of follow the benefits. The processes, uh, there's four of them within this function, are sequential. And the first thing we have to do is develop some rules to say, okay, what's an asset? What are we going to include in the program and what are we not going to include in the program? We do this as an organization and we think through about what we really need to manage. Then once we know what's going to be included in the program, then we can organize things so that we know that an asset belongs to a certain system and certain uh, parts and spares belong to this particular asset. And we can organize that typically in a computerized maintenance management system or another database so that we can access that information and easily find things that we're looking for and see the relationship between them. Then when that's done, then we can begin to make sure that we've documented everything that needs to be documented about each asset record in that database. If we have holes, for instance, we don't know what the manufacturer is, or we haven't properly formatted the name of the asset, or maybe we insist that there's going to be a serial number included for assets for the asset record to be complete, we can begin to see whatever holes we have in our asset data documentation and begin to do things to fill those holes in because we need that complete record so that we can use the information in there to compare uh, assets across the business or to decide that we share common assets in different sites, for instance, and we can leverage that in terms of spare parts or maintenance activities and, and so on. Then finally, we've got to make sure that we understand how important each asset is to the business, typically in terms of what happens, what are the consequences when this asset fails. So these processes taken together, I call them a cookbook. They are the uh, recipes in the cookbook for the function of asset identification. All right. So it's pretty straightforward and it also helps us manage the entire asset management program by breaking it down into these smaller bites of uh, processes 
that we can document and uh, customize at the site level. To use a car analogy, did you go to the car dealer last time you bought a car and asked to buy a list of parts or sub-assemblies that when you put them together would become a car? No, of course not. The tangible thing you wanted to buy would satisfy your primary need for transportation. When you went to the car dealer, that's what you bought. Transportation, that was your primary need. And it takes form in the uh, form of a car. So in the same way, businesses identify things that satisfy a primary need as assets. And that's one way to define an asset. Another way is that an item might be responsible for ensuring process parameters are not violated or collect the data that provides proof of that. This is uh, important in regulated industries in particular so that you can show that the item that is used to prove that you have uh, system quality is identifiable and tracked and taken care of. There are also items that are required by law or convention to be identified and maintained, such as fire alarms or emergency generators or pressure vessels. And finally, we may just want to keep track of our expensive items to ensure that we do take care of them and track costs associated with them to anticipate replacement over time. So we have rules for what is an asset based on criteria important to the business. This is the basis of the asset management program or its scope. We want to decide the best way to classify an asset, the entity we are going to manage using this car as our example. Our car contains many sub-assemblies and each one provides some functionality to the car, supporting the primary function of transportation, the drivetrain, the electrical system, chassis, the brake system, are examples of sub-assemblies. They all have functions in and of themselves, but they all function together to make sure that you can drive your car to get from point A to point B. The brake system sub-assembly provides the desired function of slowing the car down on demand within some desired criteria like to slow down on a dry road with good tires from 60 miles an hour in four seconds. That might be the function of the, of the braking system. And the brake system subassembly is comprised of many parts. Each of these parts has one or more ways that it can fail. So you can see that a car has many parts, which are combined to provide the functions we desire from the car. For example, the brake pads, the rotors, the tubing, the fluid reservoir, and the linkages are parts that form the brake system subassembly. So the car is just a container of related functions that serve to support or provide the desired primary function of getting from point A to point B. Managing assets at the part level is no good since we don't have the necessary resources and the processes would be too complex. So what we're trying to do here is find the sweet spot at which to manage. By identifying the parts and attaching them to sub-assemblies and then attaching them to the asset that has the primary function, we uh, make sense out of and organ begin to organize our parts, sub-assemblies, in uh, relating them to the assets. So I've developed this task to replace the fan belt on a supply fan in an air handler, and I need to find that fan belt in the computerized maintenance management system. But what I did is that when I defined the site and I set it up in the CMMS, I didn't put any organization in there. I just put all the parts in there in a big pile. How long do you think it would take me to find that fan belt? It may not even be described right, and it may not have any association with any particular asset. So I've just got to go digging through a big pile of information to find that fan belt, which isn't effective or efficient. So what we do is we organize assets and all asset information in a way that we can find out where it's at and what it does. And we do that by starting at the top and saying whether it's the site or the company or however, however it's set up. It doesn't really matter, but the site would be our starting point for this example. And on the site, we've got a couple of different plants that make different things. And so we want to look for, we know that uh, this air handler, this fan belt air handler uh, that we're looking for is in plant 1A. And within plant 1A, there are some processes and we call them sub plants. And in this plant, there's sub plant 1A02. And we know that our air handler is in that sub plant. And in the sub plant, there are systems that do different things 
to make the process work. And we know that our air handler is in the HVAC system, which is 01A-02B for this subplant. And we know that in that system, we have an asset, that air handler, asset 01. And so we know that that, that fan belt that we want is associated with that asset. So now we can go to that asset record and look and find the spare part, the fan belt that we need. And we could do this just starting at the site level and working all the way down. And we could actually start anywhere in this organization system and work up or down to find out uh, what we need to know. And this is great because in this way, we become efficient and effective when we're trying to set up things like maintenance tasks or God forbid we're reacting to an emergency or something like that, we can be more effective in the way that we approach the information that is associated with assets. It's the same concept uh, of having a junk drawer at your house and everything that nobody else can find is in the junk drawer. And it's so much better if you don't have to go digging through and hoping and wishing that you could find something rather than go to an organized um drawer that has everything labeled of where everything's supposed to be. It's kind of the same concept. So that's what asset organization methodology looks like. Now that we've identified and organized our assets, we need to make sure that we document everything in a way that's consistent, unique for each asset, that helps us locate and describe the asset and is logical to the end user. We need to have a complete set of asset data components. Now, the complete set of asset data components is just a fancy way to say that there is a defined set of information related to the asset that must exist in order for the asset record to be considered complete. We could set up uh, something like this, say asset type is vehicle, car, sports, and manufacturer is BMW and model is 535XI, and location is my house, and license plate number ABC123. That could consist of a complete asset record for us if we wanted to search through cars. Or we could just use the VIN number, I suppose. But sometimes you don't want just a one piece of information. You want to compare, perhaps, uh, I want to find all green BMWs, for instance. So you need these bits and pieces that are correct, and complete so that you're able to make those distinctions and find what you're looking for. Because remember, it's not just a single user that's using asset information, engineering, finance, maintenance, everybody is using this information in the CMMS and different groups have different ends in sight. So again, these rules can be adjusted to make sense for the business by including more or less information, as long as the other criteria are all satisfied. And those are consistent format, identifies unique assets, verifies asset location, describes asset function, appears logical to the end user, and that gives us the ability to do that query and grouping that I was just talking about. In order to properly focus asset management resources on what is important to the business, we first have to define categories that are important to the business and then decide the performance criteria within each category, and then classify assets based on that criteria. When that's accomplished, we can begin to manage assets based on their relative importance to the business. Note here, starting at the top, that asset prioritization is broken down into three major categories, business impact, quality impact, and safety impact. Now, when I say impact, I'm talking about uh, the impact or consequence of the asset failing. It disappears from the face of the earth. These major categories of business quality and safety are broken down further into subcategories where there are three for business, three for quality, and two for safety. It's business relevant, throughput, utilization, and so on. Scores and their respective criteria, then, are established for each category. It is best to have a data-driven approach utilized for a criteria review and scoring. This is things like uh, category one for safety. Relevant might be um, nobody gets hurt if the asset fails, all the way up to criteria four 
where the score would be four, of a fatality, for instance. So these criteria are ranged from number one, which is slight, all the way down to number four, which is critical. And that's how, that's how we manage that, and that's how we define and create this, um, this score. Because what we do is we take the score in each one of these boxes and we add them up. And then we have a business impact score, a quality impact score, and a safety impact score. And we add all those together and that results in our asset prioritization score. Now, when assets are identified, it's not uncommon for there to be a population of several thousand of them to deal with. The idea of asset management is to correctly focus resources like time, money, and personnel where the business will realize the most benefit. And benefits are realized in the avoidance of downtime and consequence of failure with focus on the assets that are most critical to the business. Let's sum up asset identification with a this summary here. I want you to look at something on this slide. You'll notice that every bullet starts with defining rules. And that is the hallmark of asset management is removing chaos from the way that we take care of things and identify things that we use every day on our site. It's takes opinion and passion and emotion out of the equation about how we manage assets. So what we're really doing is defining rules for processes that support functions that support the management system. In this case, we're defining rules for what to include in the asset management program and then applying the rules. And we're defining rules for how we're going to set up the relationship between systems and assets and sub-assemblies and parts based on where they are and what they do. And we, then we educate the end users about how that is set up and they can read those rules and understand how to use the information. And then we define rules for what is a complete asset record. And we bring in all the stakeholders that are gonna use that information. We don't do it in a vacuum because as we've demonstrated many times throughout this course, different entities want different things from the information. So we make sure that a complete asset record is of service to everyone that uses asset information. And then finally, defining rules for what makes an asset important to the business. Not every business is the same, but every business needs to categorize uh, the assets, uh, the, the priority categories in such a way that it makes sense to the business. And you can start to compare assets to each other and then focus resources on the things that are important to the business. It's, it's really kind of cool the way that this is set up. This concludes the Asset Identification Process Descriptions presentation. Thank you for participating.